Thank you so much for joining the online experience today. Be sure to like, comment, and share this experience with everyone you know. Let's dive in. So I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to go to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 39. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 139. So I want you to go to the book of Psalms 139 as we start a new series, If You Know, You Know. If you know, you know. Now, some of you may know that we now have two dogs living in the lion's den. Let me just stop before I begin to tell this story. Never say never. I don't like dogs, never enjoyed dogs. I always have said uh, that if God intended for dogs to live inside of a home, he would have created the capacity within their brains to build their own house, and they wouldn't have to stay outside. So again, those are just my thoughts on it, but never say never. I've always said we'll never have a dog living in our home, and now we have two dogs living in our home. And so Ella's dog, we have the first dog, it's Ella's dog. Ella's dog is called many names in our house. One, it's called PP. The other one is Peanut. And then sometimes, I think the original name, I'm not even for sure at this point, was Peanut Butter. And so it doesn't matter. I, I call it dog is what I call it, just dog. That's like dog one, and then the other one is dog two. But so Ella's dog is called many names, PP, peanut, or peanut butter. Nathan's dog that is now in the house is called Poo Poo by Ella. She thinks that's funny to call his name Poo Poo because he answers to Poo Poo. And then Nathan has called his dog Nathan Lines Jr., okay? And uh, or he's also referred to simply as Junior. And here's what I know. I know I'm being totally honest. I don't know what either one of their names are. I just know we have two dogs living in the house. And it's interesting to me that neither one of the dogs know their name either. If you walked in our house today and you just looked at them and said something, they would perk their ears up because they don't even know their own names. I think it's safe to say that the dogs that are living in the lion's den are struggling with an identity crisis. <clears throat> even with the help of a name tag or phone number, the dogs still do not know who they are. No, that's funny, but in reality, dogs simply don't have the capacity to engage in introspect. They don't have the ability to look in the mirror and say to the mirror, who am I? They don't have, the, I mean, I wish they would let me in on it. I, they don't know who they are, but it's not so with us today as humankind. The Greek philosopher, Socrates, is what he said. He says, to know thyself, know thyself. Psalm 139 goes beyond Socrates by saying, God knows you far better than you know yourself. Let that sink in for a moment, that God knows you far better than you know yourself. The psalm exalts God in Psalm 139 as omniscient. It means all-knowing. God is all-knowing. He is the beginning of knowledge. He is knowledge. He is truth. He was the beginning of truth. So truth originated with God. He is omniscient. He is also omnipresent, meaning he is simply everywhere at the same time. It's very difficult to unpack that from a theological perspective other than just say God is omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere at the same time. Now, I want to give you a little background to Psalm 139. Can I slow down? Because I want to unpack this for you because it's important that I set the context. And then once I set the context, then I'm going to start yelling and spitting at you, okay? But let me set this up. Psalm 139 was written by King David. If you remember, King David was anointed to be king over Israel. Saul had already was wearing the crown. So Saul became upset, became obsessed with uh, David because he was very jealous of King David, or, or of David. And so he sought out, he had this plan. He said, I'm going to hunt him down. And I'm going to kill him. That way he can never be king. Well, you can only imagine the tension between David's men and Saul's men. So Psalm 139, David writes this because some of the men that were serving Saul were saying some very mean and ugly things about David and who he really was. And so David, what David does is he appeals to the nature of God. In essence, he looks in the mirror and he, in essence, he wants to know, 
are these things really true, what people are saying about me? So he appeals to the nature of God. Now, why God? Because God knows us better than we know ourselves. There's sometimes we think we are right. We believe that, but we're not. Sometimes we think we're wrong. We're not. But God knows us far better than all of us. Why? Because he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. He knows you and me better than we know ourselves. So he appeals to the nature of God. And in this appeal, and really Psalm 139 is a prayer to God. And he prays to the Lord and he gives God an invitation to come and look at his heart. He said, I want you to come and I want you to search my heart. Now in the process, he answers three questions about God, about who God really is. Now let me back up. Because this psalm is really what happens in our prayer. We go to God. We got a problem. Sometimes that problem is with us. Sometimes that problem is with somebody else. Or sometimes there's a circumstance that's out of our control. But my point is we go to prayer and our focus at the beginning of that prayer is either on us or the problem or on the person who we perceive to be the problem. But by the time this all ends, it shifts from David to who God is. Not about who David is, but who God is. And that's important. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to answer these three questions. Number one, how well does God know me? Number two, how near is God to me? And number three, how involved is God in every detail of my life? Are y'all ready for this? And y'all got to buckle up. You got to say amen every once in a while and let me know you're still out there, okay? Y'all ready for this? I got a little bit left in you, so you got to get help me out here. Number one, how well does God know me? How well does God know me? Psalm 139, let's do some reading in verse 1. Now again, David is asking God, saying, Lord, I want you to look at my heart. So here's what he says. Now notice, notice what happens here. He says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You have examined my heart and you have searched. Another translation uses the word search. So I want you to circle that word, highlight that word examine, or I want you to put it in your notes this morning, search. Now, let me give you another story. He says, when you search my heart, you will know everything about me. So one night I'm sitting in my chair at home. And a friend of mine calls me and he says, hey, are you dating anybody? And I said, no. He says, hey, I got this wonderful gal. I, I just think you guys would really be great together. And so for the first time, I heard about Christy. And so immediately what I did was I began to investigate. So I became the investigator. And that's exactly what happened is I went to social media. She calls it creeping. I call it investigating and checking everything out. But I went on and I searched for her on social media because, again, I wanted to know who she was. Well, God's knowledge of David and us is based on his own investigative searching. The Hebrew word for search, by the way, if you're taking notes this morning, it means to dig. The word search. So David gives God an invitation to come examine, search, watch this, dig into his heart. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a little frightening. I'm like, God, you can just look on the outside, and that's going to be enough for me. But David gives him an invitation to come, search, examine, and dig into his heart. I love Dr. George Wood's commentary on this particular verse because he, he, he gives the illustration of this. Not, he's not, you, when I think of digging, I think of someone with a shovel. I think of someone with a backhoe. But that's not the, the visual that Dr. Wood gives here. It's the visual of an archaeologist. And if you've ever seen an archaeologist at work on a site, they don't have shovels out digging. Why? Because what they're looking for sometimes is very small. It's very minute. It, it, it's, it's just, it's, and they don't want to disturb anything or mess anything up. So they got these little bitty tools that they use, and they got a little brush. And what are they looking back on? They're looking back, and they're brushing back on this, and they're brushing back on that dirt, because they're looking for something there, right? Well, that's the visual that Dr. Wood gives in this particular passage here uh, about how God is searching David's heart. Not with the shovel, but in a very meticulous, in a very methodical way, he is peeling back layer by layer by layer of David's heart. Now watch this. When he's finished digging, he's going to know everything about David. 
and there's not going to be anything that he doesn't know. It's the same way when we ask God to look at our hearts, to look at our motives. When God is finished digging into our hearts, there's not going to be anything left that he doesn't know. He knows our routines. Listen to the words of David in verse 2 and verse 3. He says, you know when I sit down or when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything that I do. You know everything I do. Now, watch this. At any given moment, God knows everything that we are doing, and he even knows our thoughts. Verse 2 says, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. Verse 4, you know what I'm going to say before I say it, Lord. Now, many of you thought only your spouse had the ability to know that. But before your spouse was God, God knows what we're thinking. At any given moment, he knows exactly what we're thinking. He knows exactly what we're doing. And not only does he know what we're doing, but he also knows our motive behind what we're doing. So the point is, when God was finished with David, David said, Lord, there's not going to be anything that you don't know about me. All of the good, all of the bad, and all the ugly, you're going to know all of these things. Any given moment, God knows it all. Have you ever said to your spouse, friend, or coworker, or even your kids, I knew what you were thinking by the expression on your face. I knew exactly what you were thinking. Well, God doesn't have to get that close to know our thoughts. He reads our thoughts from afar, knows what we're going to say, even before we say it. Now, to most of us, that would scare us senseless. But watch David's response. Y'all ready for this? Well, y'all are not responding, but it's good. Psalm 139, verse 13 says, that you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together. I want you to underline that word knit. I want you to write it down. We're going to talk about it. Knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. That's a nice way for David to say, thank you for making me a hot mess. He says, your workmanship is marvelous. How well, what? I know it. Now that word knit, I want you to put up beside that. That is a tailor's term. And what it means is to weave and to stitch together. There's a lot of debate going on in our world today about unborn children. If you want to know how important unborn children are to God, listen to this scripture get unpacked today. While David was still in his mother's womb, God, the master weaver, began to knit him together piece by piece. Now, when you look at verse 14, he says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. The word making and the word know both refer to distinctly being marked and set apart. So watch this. Again, I'm a visual guy, so I'm putting all this together. So God's knitting David together piece by piece before his mom and dad ever saw him, before they named him, before he had his first birthday party. God was knitting him together, and when he was finished knitting him together, he put a distinct mark on him and set him apart. Now, King David was no different than you and I today. When you and I were in our mother's womb, God knitted us together piece by piece, and he put a distinct mark on our lives put a distinct mark on our lives, and he set us apart for a plan and a purpose that was designed only by God, the creator. Now, here's what I want you to know. God knew that, but now David knows it. See, it's one thing for God to know it about you, but it's another that you know that God has knitted you together, stitched you together, piece by piece, put a distinct mark on you, and set you apart to do his work his plan and his purpose for your life. And I want everyone, and especially all the young generation that's here today, I want you to lean in. Because God, the master weaver, he took every trait. He took the good. He took the bad. He took the pieces that you like and the pieces that you dislike. 
and he wove them together in you to create a masterpiece. And there are a lot of young people today are discovering, are they're, are they're, they're, they're having problems with and struggling with, who am I? Who am I created to be? Let me tell you, don't let anyone tell you who you are or who you're not. I'm here to tell you, here's what God's word says. You're not a mess today. You are a masterpiece. And while you were in your mother's womb, I took all the likes and the dislikes about you and I put this piece and that piece together and you're not a mess but you're a masterpiece and you've been created by the master weaver himself he chose he created you he put a distinct mark on you to be who he created you to be and in the process God knows everything about you he knows your thoughts he knows your words your actions all the good the bad and the ugly so stop trying to be someone or something that you are not rather simply accept you are created created to be who God created you to be Amen. and people tell me all the time they say well pastor you just don't understand you know no one likes me I'm not even sure I like myself, and, and maybe you're a little older like me, and you say, I don't like who I've become. Can I remind you that this psalm was written by a guy who committed murder, who committed adultery, and yet God said, yes, but I knitted you together. I created you to be this. And he said, I'm going to take all of that, and I'm going to use it for my design plan for your life. I want you to know that God loved David. He accepted David, and for whatever the reason, he chose to put his hand on David's life even with all the negative traits and all the bad things that you read about David and all of his poor choices, God said, yes, I'm choosing you. That's good news for you and me today. Because all of us have mistakes in our life. All of us have dislikes and likes about ourselves. But God says, I'm going to take all of that. And I took all of that under consideration when I created you and knitted you together while you were still in your mother's womb. I just want you to know that God, we need to know that we know the God that I know, he knows us and he loves us in spite of us. Isn't that good? Well, it's going to get better. Number two, how near is God to me? We'll look at Psalm 139, begin reading in verse seven. It says, David's again, he's praying, he's talking to the Lord. He says, Lord, I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, you're there. If I dwell in the oceans, you're there. Verse 10 says, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Wherever you go, your hand's going to guide me and going to support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become light or become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. So how near is God? Well, God is everywhere. Meaning you can't go anywhere where he's not already there when you get there. You cannot get away from God who is everywhere at the same time. He is near. He's in our highs and he's in our lows. He is near when you attempt to escape reality. He is near in your darkest nights, even the ones of your own making. He is near in your highlight reels and behind the scene moments. He is near before you Photoshop, edit, or even delete the picture. I just want you to know the God who created you did not create you and then send you out the door and say, good luck, let me know how it works. I'll catch up with you at the rapture. No, the God who created you, he is near you. He is near you. We have the promise of that because wherever we are, God is. Wherever we go, God is there. David said, if I go over there, when I get there, Lord, you're there. And Lord, if I go back here, when I get back there, you're back there. And Lord, if I go up there, then when I get up there, you're already there. So there's no way to escape the presence of God. Some of you know that very well because some of you were rebellious and you ran from God. You said, Lord, I got to get away. And you ran from God. God's call on your life or what God had you to do. And you ran and ran, but yet wherever you would run to, you would only find out what God was already there when you got there. Psalm 34 and 18 says, the Lord is close. That word close means like in a personal relationship. It goes even deeper than that. It means kinship. Maybe that's the reason he said, I'll be the father. I'll be a father to the fatherless. How close is he? A personal relationship. More than that, 
a kinship. He rescues those. He is close to who? He is in personal relationship with who? Who is he kin to? Those who are brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. So when you're ready to throw in the towel, when you're ready to give up, when you're ready to get away, when everything and everyone seems far away, God is near. The message version says it this way. If your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. And when you get kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. That's the nearness of God. Psalm chapter 34, verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to the cries for help. His ears are open to their cries for help. That word cry there, or the word open, refers to, watch this, a known cry. So, moms, I can put you on a playground with 40 other kids. And all 40 kids can be screaming and laughing. But if your child cries out of the 40 kids, out of all of that noise, there is something innate that moms are born with that they can recognize the cry of their children among and above all other cries. That's what the psalmist here is saying. That the Lord, watch his, his ears are open, means a known cry. He recognized, I want you to think about this, out of the billions of people on the face of the earth, because you were knitted together in your mother's womb, because he put a distinct mark on you and set you apart, he has the ability to recognize when you, his creation, calls, prays, or cries out to him. He is that near and he is that close that he can hear every cry, every prayer that you and I have as his creation. The Lord I know is near me. The Lord that I know knows me and the Lord that I know is near me. Number three, how involved is God with me? Psalm 139, I want to go back. I'm going to pick this up again. Look at verse 13. David said, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 14 says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. I want to focus on that word workmanship. It refers back to the master weaver creating a masterpiece. Now watch this. He just did not create you. He designed you. Now, if you get ready to build a house, you can't just go out to a lot or piece of ground and start digging holes and dump some lumber off and start building. There's got to be a plan. You've got to start with a plan. You can't create anything, whether it's a model car, whether you're put, you've got to have a plan. You, you, you've got to have something to refer to. So God not only created you, he designed you. Meaning this was not a random act, but you were designed with a plan in mind. Now watch this, because so many people get upset and are discouraged and are struggling with who they are, but we forget sometimes that we were created not in some random act, but we have been created to fulfill a plan and a purpose that's just for us, meaning no one else can fulfill this plan. No one else is going to look like this. No one else is going to act this way. No, but you have a distinct mark on you and you have been set apart. So when God, so God said, I created you, but it started with a plan in mind, meaning this is your purpose. Now watch this. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, for I know the what plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The word plan here, the Hebrew word for plan, it means much more than just a plan. It speaks of a careful, a skillful, an intricate weaving of a fabric. It could be translated as, I know the meticulous woven purposes that I am weaving together for your purpose. You see, the master weaver has plans for your life. 
they're not only good, but they are woven plans that have already been worked out on your behalf. That means the things that we would like to leave out, God could not leave out. Again, you look at your life, and when you look in the mirror, there are things about your physical body you wish you could change. There are things about your personality you wish God would have left out, and you wish you had something that he put in somebody else. So all the things that we would like to leave out, God said, I cannot leave those out. Why? Because it's going to take that personality trait. It's going to take that mistake. It's going to take that kind of person to fulfill this plan, because we spend our whole lives wanting to be somebody else and God spends our whole life trying to convince us that we are who he created us to be and we need to accept the fact that we are created in his image we have a distinct mark on our lives we have been set apart and nobody can fulfill our plan and our purpose other than us we're the only ones who can do that now this is amazing to me because he will take every thread of your life. I want you to catch this. He will take every thread of your life. He will take every joy, every mistake, every victory, every defeat, every win and every loss, every regret, every wound. He will take all of your questions and weave them together and skillfully to create his masterpiece. You see, it takes every page and every chapter of your life to create the story. And I want you to know that the pages and the chapters of your life have already been written, meaning God already knows what you're going to say. He knows what you're going to do. He knew about that mistake before you made it. He knew about that sin before you made it. I want you to know God had all of that in mind. And there's a lot of things that we would like to leave out. There's a lot of pieces to our personality we would like to leave out. There's a lot of emotional stuff about us that we would like to leave out. But I want you to know when God was sitting down with his own hands and he was knitting us together, he had a plan in mind. He said, I can't leave this piece out and I can't leave that piece out. I can't leave that mistake stake out. I can't leave that out because it's going to take all of those sewn together by the master weaver in order to create a masterpiece. So all of this time you've been thinking, hold on, I'm not done. All of this time you've been thinking you're a mess. You're not a mess, you're a masterpiece. And without your mess, you would not be a masterpiece. You're not getting this. You're not feeling what I'm feeling today. God takes all of those. Visualize the weaver sitting down. I remember my mom and grandma sitting in a sewing machine. Y'all know what that is? She'd make clothes for us. Oh, dear God, thank God those days are over. She'd sit down and she'd take a piece of garment, another piece of garment. She'd put them together. It looked bad when it was over, but it really looked bad before it got started. <laughs> my point is... All of the pieces of your personality, all of the pieces of your emotions, God had in mind. Because he has a plan and he has a purpose for you. And without all of these pieces, you could not, you could not fulfill the plan and the purpose that God has for your life. So I want you to stop apologizing, stop running, stop struggling with who you are. I'm not justifying mistakes, not justifying sin today. But I'm saying God has a way to take all those pieces and sew them together. He had all that in mind before you were even created. Had all that in mind before you were born. While you were in your mother's womb, that's what was on his mind. Every page and chapter of your life were needed to create your story. Everything that happens to us in life, watch this, is directed toward that goal. Has the intent of pushing us toward the plan and the purpose that God has already predetermined for our life. So all of this stuff, when I look at our lives together today as Christy, that was unknown to us. She married Ed, I married Lisa. We didn't think about how this would turn out, but God had all of that in mind from the very beginning. He knew how all that was going to work out. So he said, I'm going to take a piece of this. I'm going to take a piece of this, put together for this plan and for this purpose. He knew about all of it. Isn't that amazing? The God that we know 
knows us that intimately. And he knows what we're going to do before we do it. He knows what we're going to think before we think it. He knows before we say it what we're going to say. He knew ahead of time every mistake that you've ever made, every mistake you're going to make. He knew about all of that. He said, I need every piece of your life. And it's the joining. It's like this. It's like making something. And I don't care what you make. If you only have one ingredient, it's not going to be very good. Unless it's chocolate. You don't need anything. But there's a reason you have all these different agreement, these, these ingredients. And they're measured out. And that's how God, the good, the bad, and the ugly, is all measured out in our life. It creates these pieces that he has put together for a design plan for our life. As you look back, consider how God has woven the threads of your life together with confidence. Know that with the present threads, he can do the same thing. I'm going to close with this. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, here's that word no again. Man, I hope y'all can feel what I can feel today. God's here. He's reminding somebody. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And it's no accident. And we know that God causes everything to work together for what? For the good of those who love God. Who are called according to his purpose for them. Now notice what he says. God works all things for good. He does not say here that he works everything out the way you think he should. We keep thinking for the good means that it's going to be our way. No, no, no. You're not the creator. When it comes to God, there's no democratic process here. Okay? It's just, it's God. He has the final say. But again, he takes each piece, and each piece represents probably some good in your life, some bad in your life, and some ugly in your life. He mixes all that together. And somehow, in his sovereignty, he makes all that work together for good. The God I know is very involved in every detail of our lives. Nothing goes unnoticed with God. Scripture says he notices when a sparrow falls from a tree. Nothing goes unnoticed. And nothing happens that he already didn't see was going to happen. If you know, you know. And if you don't know, you need to know. The God I know knows you. He is near you. He is still very involved in your life. Would you bow your heads this morning? What an incredible experience. Today, if you made the decision to follow Christ, we'd love to hear about it. Head over to northwestchurch.tv and let us know today.